Good morning, afternoon, evening, all of the rest. I'm Laura Flanders, and I host a show called The Laura Flanders Show. The Laura Flanders Show can be seen every week on public television in the US, also on public radio, and is available on YouTube or at the lauraflanders.org website. It's a forward looking kind of a show that I think you would all enjoy, so I encourage you to check it out. This webinar that you have signed up for, that you are joining us in, is on power, empire, and US politics. We're going to be taking an international look, an internationalist look at election 2020 in the US. It's part of TNI's Ideas into Movement webinar series. These webinars seek to provide an internationalist perspective on key moments and issues. For those who don't know, the Transnational Institute, based in Amsterdam, it's an international activist think and do tank, I like to say. It's committed to transformative change and social justice. The webinar today was co-organized with TNI's sister organization in the United States, the Institute for Policy Studies, um, familiarly known as IPS. IPS is a progressive think tank about which you're gonna hear a whole lot more. In terms of today's discussion, you're going to be hearing from various speakers um, but I want to remind you that all of these events cost money to organize. So if you have appreciated any of these webinars up to this point, or if you appreciate this one, please consider making a donation to any or, or all of the organizations represented here. You can support the Transnational Institute, the Institute for Policy Studies, and the Laura Flanders Show at the links on your screen. So where are we? Let's start with just a little bit of setting the scene. The world woke up on Sunday to the dying days of the Trump administration, we think. On Saturday night, all the major television networks in the US called the 2020 presidential race for Joe Biden and his running mate, Kamala Harris. After the highest turnout election in over a century, there was celebration in the streets across the US and calls from foreign leaders to Biden started coming in. According to the Guardian newspaper, President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh of the Maldives was the first to call, presumably to remind Joe Biden of the urgency of addressing climate change and the waters rising on the Maldives shores. But while there has been a victory, there has not been a concession. But both Joe Biden and Donald Trump scored record-breaking vote totals, some 75 million and 70 million votes apiece. Donald Trump has not given up yet. More importantly, perhaps there's been no conceding from Trump or his party that there was anything problematic with their pursuit of America first nationalism abroad or white ethno-nationalism and proud patriarchy at home. And there's been no renunciation yet of their go it alone, profits first approach to addressing a global pandemic. On the democratic side, with Trump maybe on his way, the tensions within what was always a very fragile left-right coalition are at a breaking point. After months of effort and millions of dollars spent, the dreamed of blue tsunami didn't materialize. Looking to January, we are still going to have very bitterly divided government. And just as a reminder, in the US system, the president can do a lot through executive order, and Donald Trump certainly showed how it can be done. He can do a lot through appointments, um, but the Biden team will be walking when they walk into Washington into a very demoralized and hollowed out civil service. Crises loom on every front, from a recession to a racial reckoning to a cold winter of COVID. Legislation requires Congress and its majorities in two requires Congress and majorities in two houses. In the lower house, the Democratic majority still holds, but it's smaller. In the Senate, two Georgia seats remain undecided, but whatever the outcome there, power will be very narrowly split. For internationalists today, namely us, considering power, empire, and US politics in the global context, history could keep us up at night. Nothing unites US parties and the major media here like action abroad. 
be it tariffs on China, say, or coup plots against Latin American leftists, or anti-terror arms sales, arms sales in the names of fighting terror, to Israel or, or Saudi Arabia. The Biden foreign policy team is likely to be full of names you know from the Obama years. So what does it all add up to? Much more is needed to be said about international solidarity, and that's part of what the conversation is about here today. Connection and relationship building across borders between individuals, organizations, and their institutions are all important. So that's why I'm excited to present this panel of some of the leading thinkers and activists who have long challenged US foreign policy, working with social movements against the war in Afghanistan and Iraq for fair trade and in support of worker rights. We're joined by Phyllis Bennis, my friend, the new internationalism project director at the Institute for Policy Studies. Remember, IPS is dedicated to building a more equitable, ecologically sustainable and peaceful society. Phyllis directs the, the um, internationalism project there and she's also the author of Challenging Empire, how people, governments and the UN defy US power. Walden Bellow is an associate of TNI and the author of Paper Dragons, China and the Next Crash, as well as Capitalism's Last Stand, Deglobalization in the Age of Austerity. And we should say there's a question mark in that title. <laughs> Kathy Feingold is the director of the AFL-CIO's International Department. She is deputy president of the International Trade Union Confederation. Welcome, Kathy. And Bill Fletcher Jr. is executive editor of GlobalAfricanWorker.com and a past president of Trans Africa Forum, as well as being a longtime writer and trade unionist. In terms of today's format, to remind you, we're going to have short presentations by each of our speakers. By short, let me remind you, speakers, we're talking about between four and six minutes apiece, a little bit of discussion amongst us, and then we will open up to questions. You can share your questions, participants, through the at, throughout the session via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And throughout the session, we'll be sharing in return links to resources and further reading in the chat box. We know there's a lot of knowledge uh, among the attendees, so we very much appreciate hearing your perspectives too. Finally, if you're on Twitter or any other social media, we're using the hashtag, hashtag TNI webinars, TNI webinars. So feel free to share your thoughts and reflections with us there as well. To dive straight in, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Phyllis Bennis. I think you are well placed to talk to both the um, tenseness here in the US at this moment, being that you're based there in Washington, but also the sense of, um, um, well, I want to say possibility, maybe probability. I don't know whether you're more in fear or in hope at this moment, but we're thinking about the questions of whether uh, what we look at next is a continuation, a real rupture, or a return. What are you looking at, Phyllis? Let's unmute you for starters. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, Laura, and thanks for the reminder. Um, I think that we are all here in the US, not all, but half of us are very, very relieved uh, after the calling of the election against Trump. The rejoicing in the streets, in my view, was very much uh, a focus on being an end of the Trump era. Uh, significantly more than it was a celebration of Biden. Uh, but we do have to be very careful. This, even this election consequence is not clear yet. It's not over yet. But assuming that we will go forward with a, a post-Trump agenda, we do have to recognize that this election that did repudiate Trump did not repudiate Trumpism. And on the international front, that means that it did not repudiate international provocations, militarism, unilateralism, opposition to diplomacy, absolute global corruption, support for global dictatorships, all of these things. It was not a full repudiation of that. So we start with that reality in the context of US imperialism itself in a decline, but yet still being the most powerful empire 
indeed that the world has ever seen. The most wealthy, the strongest militarily, despite new challenges on both of those fronts, from China and from others, but it remains the most powerful single actor right now uh, in the world. And we have to take that into account as we look to, towards what will come ahead. If we look to what the Biden agenda might look like, uh, this notion of, is it about rupture or continuation or return? I think that we will see a large amount of return to the, to the Obama agenda on issues of trade, on the global war on terror, but also some of the things that we will see returning after uh, being destroyed largely by Trump, which include multilateralism and, and the role at the UN, human rights, despite the, the legacy of hypocrisy of how the US has dealt with multilateralism, the UN, human rights, having it on the official agenda was a very important tool for social movements here and globally to challenge those violations of human rights, those uh, false claims of, in, of multilateralism, that sort of thing. What the key shift that we're dealing with in terms of what are the conditions that we face in what is Biden's foreign policy going to look like is that as Laura mentioned, there has been a real shift in the Democratic Party. The left is not the, the most dominant force right now in the party, but the left wing of the party, what some call the Bernie Sanders wing, the Elizabeth Warren wing, that wing of the party is both ascendant and more powerful than it has been in generations, in decades. And in that context, I think that there is a much greater option for changing, for pressure to, to work on the Democratic Party, because the, the reason that the Democratic Party and the Biden administration really squeaked by in this, in this election, we have to be clear, they won the popular vote by several million, that's true, in the context of 150 million or so uh, electorate, that's not a big divide. It was in fact a very close election. And we have to be very sober in looking at what that means. In terms of the actual agenda, I think that we will see uh, change, some changes, but not enough. And we're going to have to fight for every one of those changes that we are able to see. The wars are going to look very much like Obama's wars, not like George Bush's wars, meaning that the reliance on massive numbers of ground troops and full occupation of countries will probably not be the common thing that we see in the next period. We will see a complete uh, continuation of the focus on drone wars and airstrikes and special forces, special operations in countries throughout, particularly the greater Middle East, North Africa region, but in a, a number of places around the world and increasing reliance on that kind of militarism. In Iran, we will see, I think, a return of the, from, from the, the, uh, the Biden administration return to the Iran nuclear deal, which of course uh, Trump had with great fanfare pulled out of the nuclear deal. There will be an effort for, and, and Biden in fact has already committed to this, to go back to the deal, it's not at all clear what additional concessions the Iranians may demand as a result of the terrible impact of four years of crippling sanctions that the US imposed on the people of, of Iran. Uh, there, there will be a price to pay for that if the US is serious about wanting to go back. But I think there will be a return to diplomacy in the Iranian uh, theater. The one place I think we'll see the biggest rupture will be on Yemen. I think that it, assuming that our movements are strong enough, I think that we will see the possibility of a real end to US support for the war in Yemen. That doesn't mean that US responsibility for that war, which has been, as we know, the United Nations has identified it as the worst humanitarian disaster in the world. The numbers of civilian casualties, particularly in the era of COVID. I think that we will see uh, pressure and we'll see whether it will be enough to force the United States to take some responsibility for the, the, the disaster that it has helped bring there as it has in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then finally, on the question of the global pandemic, I think we will see a rupture with the Trump position. We will see a rejoining of the WHO, whether that includes joining COVAX, the international WHO-led 
uh, coalition to make sure that any vaccines that are produced are made available globally on an equitable basis. That means challenging the big pharmaceutical companies in the United States. Whether the Biden administration is prepared to take that on, a big question right now, we have no idea. And if there's any move towards that, we are going to need a massive level of mobilization, popular mobilization in the United States to demand that that must be part of the US policy on dealing with COVID both domestically and globally. So we're in for a very long struggle, I think. We're, we're going to have to fight very, very hard. The protests against what are likely to be the appointments in things like the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, they are not going to be people that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party support, let alone people that we would support. And those protests, I think, are going to have to start on day one after the inauguration. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, Walden, to you, um, I, I want to take every opportunity to remind people that Naomi Klein has called you the world's leading no-nonsense revolutionary, and I think we're going to hear no-nonsense from you <laughs> now. Um, I haven't actually heard whether the Philippines President Duterte has called Biden, but I suspect he hasn't. He certainly lost a, a friend in Trump. Um, but one question I do have for you is um, the reaction in, in your part of the world and your sense of what will be the implications for the kind of authoritarian leadership that has not been unelected in this administration, even if Trump has been um, given a, 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 a humbling to a degree, they haven't. And many are drawing from the tightness of the election, in fact, some comfort that Trumpism did pretty darn well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And uh, it's great to see all of you. And uh, thanks to TNI and IPS for sponsoring you know, this um, dialogue that we're having today. Uh, first of all, uh, Laura, um, President Duterte did congratulate Biden. Okay, this was about two days ago. And um, he, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, his threat to withdraw the Philippines from the um, visiting forces agreement with the United States that he made a few months ago, then he backed away from that. I think that uh, he is going to keep the United States, uh, he, you know, that agreement with the United States. Uh, um, of course, to our great disappointment, because I personally had felt that uh, Duterte would, in fact, move to cancel that agreement. And and uh, so I think generally I would say that in this part of the world, uh, you know, that there was also a sigh of relief when uh, Biden came out uh, as winning uh, the uh, elections. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Um, well, one of the things we've got to remember is that the moves to define China as the strategic competitor of the United States. It was initially made by George Bush back in um, uh, 2001, 2002, but that was subordinated to Bush's effort to win China uh, in the global war against terror, bring China in there as an ally. And it was really under the Obama move to really act towards China as the strategic competitor of the United States. And if we remember, it was uh, President Obama back around 2011, 2012, that uh, initiated what he called the Pacific Pivot, which was the redeployment uh, of uh, the majority uh, or the bulk of US naval power uh, to the Pacific. And 
the aim was quite clearly to uh, contain China militarily. Um, I think that um, the deterioration in terms of the political and economic relations between China and the United States did not start with Trump. Okay, uh, it, you know, um, it 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 um, uh, accelerated with Obama, uh, and of course Trump brought it to a really new level. Um, so what would they expect here? I, I think that looking at the statements of Biden and Biden's people, uh, I think they are worried about China's um, industrial policy. Um, they're worried about um, um, Chinese um, technological advances. They're worried about what they would see as China's violations of intellectual property rights, much like uh, maybe not as extremely as Peter Navarro, uh, you know, but certainly th th that same concern about China's type of economic industrial model bugs key Democrats and economic specialists. Uh, and in some of his statements, in fact, Biden has already referred to that. Okay. Um, my sense is that you're, Biden is not going to push on with the trade war. Um, um, but I think on this front of challenging China in industrial policy, technology, intellectual property rights, I think that um, that will continue. Um, and much of Peter Navarro's agenda will be carried on, although maybe not in as crude a fashion as Navarro. Um, um, I think though that one thing that we should be expecting is the Biden administration will, um, uh, especially when it comes to differentiating itself from the Trump administration, uh, take on the banner of human rights when it comes to China and um, uh, use that as a sort of a soft power kind of stick. Um, and, um, and I think that over on that, I, I think we can expect that there will be more and more a appeals to that when it comes to dealing with China uh, with, you know, um, you know, some, um, you know, with Beijing, um, you know, being um, uh, um, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, reacting in mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. um, then um, that will also come up when it comes to Hong Kong. Uh, then I think that uh, one area where I think there was generally a positive um, moves on the part of Trump was Korea. Okay, um, let's face it. You know, Korea. You know, Trump did contribute to ending the Cold War in the Korean Peninsula. Okay. And you know that kind of very tense, hot war. I mean, cold war that existed, um, you know, before uh, Trump. Uh, that I think um, has been significantly reduced. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, now, whatever his motivations were, I think that in this area, I think that it was a plus. In, in the Korean Peninsula. All right, well, uh, yeah. yeah. One last thing though, that I would like to say is there has been basically, you know, what has been really the basic continuity of US policy in the Asia Pacific has been provided by the military, 
the U.S. military. There's been a continuation from Bush to Obama to Trump, and I expect that that kind of continuity will uh, keep up with Biden. Now, this is what I, what, what I worry about because the military posture towards China has become more and more aggressive over the years. And the one thing that I would just like to say at this point is that the operative doctrine, military doctrine of the United States is called air sea battle and that its conceptual foe is very clearly China. Mm -hmm. So the US seventh fleet is out there uh, in the South China Sea with a lot of very jeweling kind of moves with uh, China. And I think that this kind of provocative interactions with China, especially on the naval front, is going to continue under Biden. So I'm hearing soft power with warships um, and, a, and a dangerous continuity, dangerous level of continuity. Um, Bill Fletcher, I want to come to you um, as former president of the Trans Africa Forum, um, among other things. And I mentioned executive editor of GlobalAfricanWorker.com. I got to ask you to talk about what we're hearing about um, famine in, in Yemen, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, South Sudan. Um, the COVID crisis, of course. None of this uh, got much discussion on the campaign. Um, the continent of Africa was barely mentioned during the campaign. We're likely to hear from Joe Biden that he will rejoin the WHO, but that in and of itself is not a, both, you know, that's not a solution to the crisis that, that continent faces. Um, I'd love your, your take and, and also your sense of how U.S. foreign policy um, gets taken up within the United States now uh, after an election that touched on it so little. Well, thank you, Laura. And let me, um, let me respond to that. I wanna make three points in general, but I wanna respond specifically to what you're raising and, and perhaps it will come up later in the discussion. Um, when you're living at the heart of the empire, uh, it's very easy for people to deny the importance of international affairs. Um, and, and, you know, national chauvinism is very much alive and well in the United States. And so it's, it's, it's uh, very easy, and we see it election after election, where very, very important international issues are basically brushed aside as uh, secondary to uh, our various domestic concerns. And the absence of a strong constituency in the United States that practices uh, genuine solidarity uh, further complicates the matter. Um, three points about the elections overall. One is that these elections were about racism, revanchism, and the rejection of reality. Um, and and the, the, the Trump forces and the, the articulation over the last four years around domestic and global racism have been absolutely phenomenal in that uh, opening up all sorts of doors that many people thought had been closed um, and, and appealing to this fear among large numbers of whites of a changing demographic, you know, what they call uh, white replacement or white genocide. Uh, the issue of revanchism is a catch-all for the entire politics of, of revenge and the assertion that something was taken from somebody that they want back. And we see this playing out at the level of uh, uh, gender, uh, foreign policy, uh, and this whole notion of let us return to a more comfortable era like the 1950s. And the third thing is this rejection of reality. Um, that we had 70 million people that voted for someone who denied the importance, uh, the reality of the COVID pandemic and denied the reality of climate uh, disaster. Uh, people were doing that. We should stop excusing it. People were explicitly voting for that. And we've got to deal with that. That's part of our political reality. 
Second thing is, um, yes, this is uh, the election results, as you point out, uh, indicate how divided the United States is. But I think we should understand historically, the United States has been very divided since its inception. And you look at election after election, and every so often there's you know, a huge gap. But it's very frequent that there's not a huge gap. The 1960 election, for example, between uh, Kennedy and Nixon was, uh, was settled with uh, Kennedy uh, having, I think, maybe 1% of the popular vote over Nixon. Um, one of the things that's different, however, is that when Republicans win close elections, they claim a mandate. When Democrats win close elections, they second guess themselves, they do rah, 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 you know, this is terrible, we didn't do well enough. And then they just sink into a funk. Uh, you know, uh, Trump lost the popular vote in 2016, but he and his minions walked away claiming a mandate. So we have to understand the propaganda of this. The third point is that the issue of global revanchism versus global internationalism or global uh, multilateralism in terms of identifying Trump and, and versus Biden. So, so Trump's politics globally, to the extent that there was any coherence, were revanchist and a peculiar form of isolationism. And I, I, I think that people uh, often don't get that when we talk about isolationism in the United States, we're not really talking about isolationism. There never really has been an isolationist movement in the United States where people said, shut us off from the rest of the world. U.S. isolationism means something very specific. It means we do not want to be encumbered by agreements. We want to be able to do whatever the hell we want to do whenever we can. So even when you look at the 1930s, the so-called isolationist movement was basically softcore fascist. It basically did not want to intervene in Europe, but it never said, let's pull out of Latin America. Let's stop mucking around with Asia. Um, and so Trump is very consistent with that. Um, I think that what we're going to see with Biden, as has been pointed out, is much more a return to sort of the capitalist multilateralism. Um, you know, the, the Biden serving as the chair of the board of global capital. And in the interest of time, let me just say one thing about the issue of China that I think we have to consider. There really is a kind of a contradiction. And it existed, it's existed for a while. It was existing under the Obama administration, but also under Trump. And I think we'll see it with, uh, with Biden. And this contradiction between the interest of the transnational capitalist class and its ties within China and the interests of certain state sectors in the United States, uh, particularly the issue of the military and the role that China plays as a propaganda piece for the right wing. Uh, and, and so I think we have to understand how incredibly complicated this overall situation is. In the interest of time, Laura, let me just stop there. We would love just one or two words on the question of Africa though. I mean, this continent facing, I mean, I think it's the UN now saying famine virtually guaranteed. Yemen, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, South Sudan, you've got a looming civil war in Ethiopia. I just, just, you think you have a minute. Do you have a minute okay. to give on that? So Trump didn't give a damn about Africa. So that's the easy part of the answer. Now the issue of Biden is, um, I think Laura, it's gonna depend on whether there really is sufficient pressure on Biden from a pro-Africa world constituency. Um, because I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there will be certain kinds of uh, uptick in uh, uh, humanitarian assistance. I'm sure something like that's gonna happen. But will the Biden administration, for example, deploy an envoy to help to try to mediate the conflict in Ethiopia? I, I don't know. Back in the Obama, when Obama was in the Senate, he uh, authored some legislation around the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where he was calling for a special envoy and for particular kinds of assistance to try to remedy the conflict. Um, 
whether the Biden administration will go forward with these kind of measures, I, I don't want to be, I'm not going to be cynical. I'm going to say it really depends on us. Um, I, don't, I think that the default position for most US administrations post Cold War is that Africa is largely irrelevant except from the standpoint of natural resources. Um, that will only change if we raise hell. All right, well, that's not cynical. That's exactly on message for this webinar. So thank you, Bill, for that. Um, I just want to remind people that throughout these presentations, you can be sharing your questions using the Q&A button down there at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to be sharing links to resources. We are sharing links to resources in the chat. And if you're on Twitter or other social media, don't forget to be out there using the hashtag, hashtag TNI webinars. So we look forward to getting to your questions, which we will in just a minute. But I'm very inter interested in hearing now from Kathy Feingold. She's the AFL-CIO International Director and Deputy President of the International Trade Union Confederation. For those that don't know, that is a global body representing 200 million union workers around the globe. She has more than 20 years of experience in trade and global econ economic policy. And um, in 2020, Speaker Pelosi appointed um, Feingold to the Independent Mexico Labor Expert Board, the body created under the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, the agreement that um, uh, was supposed to monitor and evaluate labor reforms and worker right compliance in Mexico. Um, there's so much to talk to you about, Kathy, but obviously um, perhaps our audience today could do with just a little primer on how embedded in the global capital universe uh, this, admi this incoming administration of Biden-Harris uh, is, uh, and in particular, perhaps in the IT and, and tech universe, um, Kamala Harris hailed as a history breaker in so many ways, first woman, first woman of color, child of immigrants, South Asian, you name it, um, but very heavily embedded in Silicon Valley. And we saw a very important ballot initiative go down to defeat this election that would really have secured some rights for so-called um, gig workers in the drive share economy, uh, went down to massive defeat uh, millions of dollars spent uh, and some of the public faces of the Uber side and Lyft side, the corporate side, uh, fighting for the defeat of this initiative were very tightly tied to the democratic establishment, even to Harris's own family, her brother-in-law, and to um, the former Obama administration and the former Valerie Jarrett, who sits on the board of Lyft. So um, in terms of the future challenges of future workforce, uh, US-wise and global-wise, over to you. Thanks so much, Laura, and thanks to IPS and TNI. It's great to be with everybody. And Laura, you, you jump right into some of the big challenges. But let me just say, um, I think as others have already stated, you know, this election is situated in a whole set of crises that already existed, right? Pandemic, economic inequality, Laura, you're already talking about, we already had enormous economic inequality um, policies that were already, uh, you know, pre-Trump administration that were already very anti-worker, racial inequality, climate, attacks on democratic institutions. And we've actually seen movements meeting and calling for systemic change. So I actually start from a place of, it's the movements that give me hope. It's the movements that organized in this election and the movements that are gonna make the change happen, not necessarily in an administration. We're gonna need movements holding this administration um, you know, every every step of the way um, to make sure that we have uh, a policy that works for uh, working people and for the climate. And I actually think we have an opportunity um, like we haven't seen before to really align because of these movements, um, domestic demands around anti-militarization, uh, addressing racial inequality, economic inequality with our foreign policy. Um, you know, traditionally we have domestic policy over here and global is some other kind of policy, but I think we need to be looking at what are the demands we're seeing made here in the US um, and how do those play out globally. So we need to uh, challenge, I think, you know, whether it's the Make America Great Again uh, framework. Uh, let's, let's remember, we've always had American exceptionalism framework. We've had many frameworks that have been problematic globally and we need to challenge those. And I think, again, this crisis makes it uh, it seem uh, you know that we really need to build something new. How can we be exceptional in the face of a, a, a health pandemic and and the climate crisis? We all need to be in this together. So we're really in this moment of needing to build a new um, framework for global policy. Um, I think the president-elect 
in various articles has laid out, you know, we need to reclaim our, our seat at the table. Um, we need to continue to write the rules. And I have to say, this gives me pause because to your point, Laura, the rules that have been written to date, whether it was under the Trump administration or previous democratic administrations have been precisely um, pro-corporate and not pro-worker. And so I think a big challenge that we are going to have, and you mentioned Silicon Valley, and I can talk about Proposition 22 that people aren't familiar with, which was about um, platform economy workers, um, is how do we, as movements, as unions uh, get to the table to make sure um, that we are reshaping rules. We're not going back to some old normal where there was this incredible imbalance between workers and capital. So one is um, whatever table we're going back to, uh, we need movements, we need uh, uh, unions at the table to shape those policy. The second is the, the notion that we are just going to go back to multilateralism, to this global architecture that was just fine before, you know, four years ago. Let's be clear, we have a global architecture that's not fit for purpose. And we keep, you know, those of us, uh, I, I feel like, you know, the challenges we have in the global labor movement is we both engage um, the, the multilateral system and at the same time we need to be thinking about how to transform it. Um, it is, uh, you know, a system that has these uh, rules ingrained in them that are, you know, pro pro corporate, um, not uh, very much uh, around the uh, vision that the U.S. has. That's a racialized vision of, of foreign policy, of how our supply chains, how we're opening up markets. And so, I think um, one big task we have is. What is our vision for a new global architecture? What is a multilateral system that would work um, for working people? And I think, um, you know, this is the moment to be doing it. Uh, we don't, there is, we don't know what the new normal is. We're not going backwards. We know it didn't work before. And I think all of us are here to figure out what is it? What are the rules that we need to put forward? We're good at, you know, at critiquing. Um, I think that, you know, again, you know, Biden has said as a nation, we have to prove that we're ready to lead again. And again, this gives me a little bit of pause. He says with the example of our power, but also with the power of our example. Uh, but this is, you know, then this means if our example to the rest of the world needs to be, how do we rethink military budgets or police budgets, which are the demands here in the United States from the Black Lives Matter movement? How do we stop militarizing community of color here and globally? How do we stop militarizing our borders and, and, and address immigration from a very different framework? How do we actually welcome asylum seeking families? So I think, you know, the vision that we're hearing from the Biden administration is one that probably is comfortable to folks from who, who from the Obama administration. But I would say we're in a very different moment and we are going to need to be challenging um, this framework of, of what power um, should look like. A couple other thoughts on, I think, a proactive agenda, and then I know we're going to open it up here. Um, one is, I think, uh, Biden's promise on these executive orders is really important. Paris Agreement, the WHO, the Muslim ban being overturned, the military ban on transgender, um, and the Dreamers program. That's a good start. But that is just bringing us back to, uh, you know, where we were four years ago, and we need to, you know, really uh, move forward in a different way. Um, so the economic model, we are in a critical moment where you have everyone from the Financial Times editorial board to the Pope agreeing that the neoliberal model of the past four decades has not worked. Um, so we need to take advantage of this moment. How do we um, make sure that when economic policy, when the rebuilding that's going to happen have to happen post-pandemic happens um, where governments are in a room negotiating not on behalf of corporations, but on behalf of the needs of workers and of people and of the environment. That's something we need to be doing right now. If we're going to rebuild with resilience, we're going to need to rebuild in a way that recognize resilience means social protection for workers, a new social contract for workers. Two other points. Um, uh, one, I would say uh, trade policy. That's one that we hotly debate uh, in the United States, but it really needs to be part of this broader rules-based uh, economy that we need to reshape. Um, the US has supported you know, a system that's elevated capital over labor for years and years. And we're always in a situation of tweaking bad neoliberal uh, models. We need to put forward a new model. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, it's it's high time that we uh, transition and, and get a new model. So I see, Laura, that my time is is coming to an end. Well, Let me well I have 
just one follow-up question and then I and I'll give you a chance to, to, to end probably, but I have to take the moment to um, plug an upcoming episode of the Laura Flanders Show, which is talking exactly about these questions. Um, and we have a little into, or not so little interview with Mary Kay Henry, the president of the SCIU right now on our podcast stream. So I urge people, she's talking exactly about this question of the new normal. If you go to lauraflanders.org, forward slash listen, you'll find it. Um, but the question or two questions that she raises, uh, one is how do you accomplish anything like a new normal when we have as much division as we do in Washington? But the second question that I have for you, Catherine, Kathy, is a follow-up just because so, people, so few people really understand the relationship that you sit at the nexus of, of internationalism and US labor. Um, we just saw an election in which if the exit polls are correct, 40% of union households voted for Trump. Um, to what extent is there discussion within the international body that you represent of a reaction to that? I guess I'm wondering, is there help coming from other countries to our labor movement? So absolutely. And I know we're gonna talk, uh, we have heard from around the world about this current moment. So yes, we're getting um, support and solidarity because Look, uh, civil, civil society is being attacked. Unions are being attacked. Democracy is being attacked around the world. We're hearing from our brothers and sisters in the Belarus independent unions, Zimbabwe. They all have inspired us about the pushbacks we've had to do here around democracy. But let me just answer your other question, Laura, because I know we'll have a few more moments on, on the social movement piece, which is I actually think that there are issues that bring people together. Um, and I, I think that the, I'm sure Mary Kay probably, uh, Henry of SEIU probably uh, echoed some of this about building a new social contract. Imagine if we asked about policies, trade policy, global economic policy, how we support supply chains in other countries. If we ask the simple question, does it contribute to the well being of working people and does it protect the environment? What if we centered things by asking those questions and policies in a different way? If we had a different light, you know, by which instead of is it, you know, shareholder profits being maximized and supply chain, uh, you know, or the flexibility, if we had a whole different set of questions. The other thing I think is if you if you argue for this moment, both in the US and globally, that workers, we need a different relationship between labor and capital, you need a new social contract, you need to rebalance that. Health and safety protections, I don't think anyone's going to argue against. Um, living minimum wages. I think there's a whole basic fundamental rights to organize, to speak your mind, uh, uh, you know, so that you're you're safe when you do it. Um, I think there's a whole foundation that we can build that actually can bridge a divide, um, that can build more power for working people across divides. I know it's going to be a bumpy road ahead. Um, absolutely. Um, our movement uh, does a lot of uh, internal uh, debates about this, but I do think that there is a place that we can build domestic and global visioning that really is about uh, building more power for working people, protecting the environment, um, and uh, building back better uh, a more transformative economy. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, Kathy, appreciate it. Um, again, I wanna remind you, you can ask questions. We have a lot of really good ones, but I wanna give our panelists a chance to pick up on any point that they uh, heard uh, or were inspired by in the comments of their fellows here. And, and just, just throw out a few things I haven't heard us discuss, although I know we wanted to get to. One was this question of rising authoritarianism around the globe. Um, what's changed or what hasn't uh, with this election on that front? Uh, Islamophobia. We haven't discussed the rising tide of that prior to this election. Has anything changed there? Migration policy, what's likely to change? Um, Kathy talked on about a little bit about uh, workers' rights. Walden talked about human rights. Um, but we have some core questions, I think, around the right of um, populations to move and this question of, of real migration uh, in a time of climate crisis. Uh, there will likely be many more questions coming from audience, but well, Walden, why don't I begin with you? Is there something you either want to follow up on from your own comments? Yes, yes or just a couple of want to? Thanks, Laura, and thanks to uh, Phyllis, uh, Bill, and and Catherine for the really insightful remarks. Uh, just one thing: uh, when I mentioned human rights. Um, I was really mentioning it in the context of it being used as a weapon 
by democratic administrations. You know, I mean, and that's that's been that's been really problematic. I mean, I mean, human rights are extremely important, but it should not be used as it was by democratic administrations as a part of uh, uh, diplomatic uh, competition. And that I think would be very worrisome if it were to take place again with the, Obama, uh, with the Biden administration. The second thing is um, I worry that um, the Biden administration is in fact going to try to resurrect, bring back the World Trade Organization from the moribund state that it is in now, okay? And um, my sense is that has to be really opposed because the WTO has been one great neoliberal disaster um, uh, for working people in the United States and for uh, people in, in, in developing uh, countries. Um, the third thing that I would just like to pick up on is what Bill said. Um, on the one hand, you know, um, you know, corporate America was um, extremely central to uh, the re economic relationship with China. China was um, one of the pawns that was used in order to batter down the labor movement in the United States with, you know, cheap labor in, in China. And um, on the one hand, there's been that alliance that has weakened uh, somewhat recently. Um, uh, but um, on the other hand, you've had, as Bill said, uh, now the, the, the US military really, really, you know, um, acting towards China as, um, you know, as a, you know, as, as, as a force that has to be contained. Uh, and despite the fact that by all military indicators, China is so far behind, there is this push by the US military to uh, in fact take a much more aggressive stance uh, towards uh, China. And um, two other points that really needs to come in here. Uh, I think it is no secret that large parts of Wall Street and Silicon Valley supported Biden. Uh, and, you know, we can go into the reasons for that. And I think a big challenge will be how, um, how to get the administration to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, begin to control, you know, this, this too big, capitalist forces that have been so responsible for so much damage to, um, to people globally, yeah. okay? Uh, and one last thing, if I may, uh, Laura, is I'm really not convinced that the question of power has been settled in the United States. I, I really feel that Trump has a big racist Republican base, you know, that, you know, at some point uh, is not, you know, can move into extra parliamentary kind of solutions. Um, and this is why I'm, I, I'm sort of really looking at this transition. And it does seem to me that, um, I'm not, on the one hand, you can look at the Republican leaders. On the other hand, you could look at that base and that's a racist fascist base that the Republican leaders don't want to offend at this point because they're going to lose votes or lose their positions if they do that. And I think that's going to be a very big factor over the next few years in the United States. 
Uh, I think there are already people saying, Walden, that the future looks bright for Trumpism without Trump. Um, and that fact that Trump was able to do as well as he did, 70 million votes and counting, sure. um, in the middle of a pandemic, in a recession, um, against a candidate who did everything he possibly could to appeal to that base, uh, is simply reason to look around for a more effective, less buffoonish leader going forward. Uh, so we hear, we hear you, Walden. I want to come to you on that, Phyllis. Uh, a, on this question of um, the status of power in the United States, but also globally, are there multilateral, multinational uh, uh, alliances? Joe Biden says he wants to rebuild them, um, that we would rather were not rebuilt, <laughs> uh, whether you're thinking the W. TO or a strengthened and more bellicose NATO? Yeah, I'm just on the point that you just raised, Walden, I, I think this is something that we don't know yet. Um, I think that we do have to keep in mind how much this election was racialized on both sides. Racism was the fundamental um, motivating factor. It wasn't the only factor, but it was the, it was the, the one at, at the root of Trump's supporters, for sure. It's also true that Biden's victory, as narrow as it was, was made possible by black voters as well as Latinx voters in, in key areas. And that's not insignificant here. This emerged in the context of the Black Lives Matter mobilizations of the spring and summer that were very consciously created in a way that were not only protests in the street, but were also involved with massive get out the vote and voter registration drives. Uh, in particularly in, in impoverished areas of black communities and brown communities that had not had, that had not seen that kind of engagement earlier. And that was very important as well. And I think that gives us some hope for the global versions. I think there, there is a move towards a global Green New Deal and a global movement to support that. The Black Lives Matter protests sparked similar anti-racist movements and protests using that same slogan all around the world. That gives us the basis for creating a more permanent, more, more solid global movement against racism and against white supremacy, which is so rooted in colonialism all over the world. So I think all of those things give me some hope. Multilateralism is always a dicey proposition. You know, you, you mentioned, Laura, the, the book I had written about the role that includes stuff about the role of the UN in challenging US power. That only happens when there are global movements forcing it to do that. And the book I wrote before that was on US domination of the United, of the United Nations. And that's, that part has not changed. <coughs> the notion of taking up, for example, do we even want the US to go back into WHO? Isn't it kind of better off without the US? Well, it isn't because number one, it gets to the question of money and control. Those two things often go with the US, but without that money, it's going to be very, very difficult for the WHO to deal with a global pandemic. It also helps, it's a tool, again, it doesn't operate by itself, but it's a tool for social movements, both in the United States and globally, to hold the US accountable to the claims that it makes. It doesn't do that by itself, whether in the WTO, in the General Assembly, in the Security Council, in WHO or anywhere else. But I think that we do have to recognize that internationalism, which is movements of people, need global mechanisms of control over their own governments. And it comes back to the question that you just raised, Laura, about the issue of migration. What was destroyed in the last four years in the United States was not only through the Muslim ban, that was the most dramatic and the most horrific in many ways. And it led to a situation where all refugees were now denied the right to even apply for asylum in the United States, where immigrant kids were, as we all know, separated from their parents and put in cages, held in cages, literally. And these are international global issues that require global movements to, to challenge in an effective way. And it, it gives us the possibility with those global challenges to raise global movements. The, the rise of migration, we now have over, it's close to 80 million people now, 70, it's in the mid seventies, I'm not sure exactly where it is right now, but it's on the rise of people who have been forced to leave their homes 
whether becoming internally displaced or becoming refugees. And overwhelmingly, the reason that people are being forced to leave their homes has everything to do with climate, which has everything to do with US policies on climate, with violence and military action, which has everything to do with US support for militarism around the world, and with economic devastation, which has everything to do with US corporate driven economic policies. So if we look at those three arenas of economic policy, climate policy, and military policy, what we see is that the US role in all of those ways has been devastating to people all around the world. So we need desperately global movements that will make possible a global challenge to those, uh, so, to those US, to those US policies. So let me um, go to you, Kathy. You sit at, on in one of those global movements, structurally and institutionally, um, and I think philosophically. Um, how do we instrumentalize solidarity? Uh, uh, how do we actually make it have flesh and blood? breath and bones. I mean, here in the US, we have lots of polls telling us that the majority of people are for single payer health care, national health care, or the majority of people are for housing as a human right, but they don't vote as if they actually believe any of that stuff is ever going to come to pass. And they don't seem to have much confidence that life would be better um, under those under administrations that might push for that. So we get a Biden um, candidate, not a Bernie Sanders one, for example. Uh, how do we instrumentalize the kind of action that you're hearing about needed uh, in the name of internationalism? Well, I think we're already doing it. I mean, I think that um, we've been spending these years, um, I think nothing like this kind of rise of authoritarianism. Um, if you look at the increase, even during COVID, the increased attacks on civil society, um, you know, there's uh, 94 countries with emergency declarations that prevent people from meeting and use all kinds of excuses for bringing people together. Despite the increased repression during this period of time, you have seen more movements um, coming together. Um, uh, you know, the support for Black Lives Matter coming from our South African and Brazilian brothers and sisters. I mean, I have seen this as a moment of a lot of intersections with, with movements. Um, more transformative than the traditional north-south, um, you know, we, we, we send solidarity. It's about building power together, building analysis together. So that gives me hope in, in this moment. A couple other um, thoughts to some of your other, like the vision I think that we're creating as, as transnational movements. Um, one is um, rejecting this notion, and you got to this a little bit, Laura, about winners and losers, right? So that there's only an economy, we can only, you know, our policies around migration right now. Our labor laws don't protect many migrant workers. Um, you know, social protection systems we see, we see during COVID don't protect many migrant workers. We need to change that. And I think you're seeing growing uh, collective demand. Um, the notion, we have the same notion around the platform economy where rebuild, you know, the, the Uber and Lyft invested hundreds of millions of dollars to, uh, uh, to win this proposition because what they don't want is that all workers get protections and are not you know misclassified as independent so there's a lot at stake right now the whole silicon valley there's a lot at, at stake with the biden administration but there are global campaigns taking on uber and lyft there are global campaigns building um, a shared analysis of what has to happen we're not taking this on just in california to be clear you know the international transport workers federation is on this so i feel that we're already trying to um to build this I want to reflect on something, Walden, you said about human rights. Um, I think human rights came out of a response to neoliberalism and has, you know, and I, I see myself as part of, you know, a broader human rights movement. It's been a bit of a band-aid where we've tried to make a, a neoliberalism a bit better. The current moment uh, obviously means that our human rights uh, movement needs to be much more focused on this economic piece. On, on challenging corporate power. Um, I think you know, Walden, the, the global labor movement, the AFLCI has been very engaged in um, addressing the Uyghur um, situation in, in China of forced labor. And it really gets that you can't 
just have a human rights campaign, you must target corporate interests. You must make it that corporations cannot profit from forced labor in the global economy. So it's not just a nice human rights campaign that we're gonna make it all look better. You actually have to transform the supply chain and economic system. And so I think thinking of human rights in a different way, um, not about making us feel better about the neoliberal system, but about human rights being part of um, challenging that very system in a rights-based uh, uh, foundation. So, um, you know, I, I, the, the last thing that I think has been um, transnational that a lot of groups are working on, including IPS and others, uh, is around rethinking our economy has changed. And I think sometimes progressive movements haven't caught up to the time. Digital, data, how are we taxing it? How are our movements demanding? I mean, of course, these multilateral institutions aren't fit for purpose. They can't even keep up with how things are, you know, are, um, are being shaped. The US government walked out of talks because Silicon Valley didn't want a digital or data tax. These are the challenges we are going to face as transnational movements. We have to constantly be thinking about why is Silicon Valley so happy with Joe Biden? Uh, because he's gonna support that agenda. We are gonna need to be in there uh, making sure we uh, push forward with a clear intention. We're gonna need very new tax policy to redistribute wealth. Thanks. And we're going to need new media. And I just have to make one more plug for my show. We have two shows coming up exactly on these topics, pandemic economics, new organizing, abolition economics. Check out uh, the Laura Flanders show, which I'm only boasting about because our panelists speak to exactly these questions of, in, you know, a, not just a vision of what an alternative might be, but examples of alternatives in action all across the country. So check it out. Um, Bill, I I'm gonna throw a question to you from Ali H on our Q&A board. She says, as a US citizen born abroad, I am constantly gobsmacked, good British term, and frustrated by how disempowered and narrow focused the interest and ability to coalesce around a broad multiracial intersexual movement the working class in the US is. If four years of Trump didn't result in a general strike, what would it take for America's working class to really flex muscle Bill. Uh, and how many hours do I have, Laura? Um, well, uh, this, is, this is really, it's a huge question. Um, I, I think what it points to is that if you don't understand, if you don't really come to grips with the history of the United States, then you really can't understand the moment that we're in right now. And um, which is one of the reasons, by the way, that I don't use the term Trumpism. Um, I talk about right-wing populism. I talk about neo-fascism. As my wife said, Trump is the rattler on a rattlesnake, right? It is the, he is the person making the noise, but he's not the one that's biting and putting the poison into our veins. Uh, that started a long time ago. One could argue it started in 1607. But if you want to be more recent, you can say 1964 with Goldwater and 68 with the Nixon Southern strategy. I think that the U.S. working class has been deeply divided on race. Race has colorized the way people look at issues of class and gender. Uh, I mean, clearly issues of gender. I mean, when you look at the open misogynism of this guy in the White House, and yet the, the percentage of white women supporting him increased since 2016. Um, so, so I think we have to understand that the divisions within the working class are very, very uh, uh, significant. And then with all due respect, Kathy, because uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, I think that the, the, the national labor movement has been completely paralyzed at the level of strategy um, and, and for a very long time, but particularly after the 2016 election, that the national labor movement really didn't know what to do, uh, in part because of the premature uh, endorsements of Hillary that were done over the heads of the members, and in part because they have run away from discussing race, gender, right-wing populism, international policy, and, and this has come back and bit us in the rear. And the movement has not known how to respond. And so instead, we see this fragmentation, further fragmentation. So I think to um, 
you, this idea of a general strike, well, you know, let, look, let's be real. There hasn't been a, a general strike in the United States since 1946, meaning that most of us have not a clue outside of what we've read in books about general strikes that have taken place elsewhere, what a general strike is and how you go about organizing it. So there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of revitalizing a labor movement that's capable of implementing a general strike. Because see, when you let your cannon get filled with water, the cannon rusts. I, I fear we have a rusty cannon. Um, Indeed. Uh, several of them probably. Uh, we have a lot of great questions. And before I get to some more, I just want to remind people that this is not your last chance to engage with TNI experts. Um, there are more um, panels coming up. And I'm just going to mention them now because there's this tendency for the end to come and everyone to leave before they hear the critical forward promotes of future webinars. But there are a number of TNI webinars coming up. Um, on the 25th of November, a discussion on Islamophobia aforementioned in Europe. Um, on the 9th of December, a webinar on anti-racism and solidarity. Um, how do we unrust our uh, cannons? Uh, we're also going to be doing all the programming I mentioned on the Laura Flanders show. And uh, there are lots of places that you can subscribe for information on events for TNI, IPS, my own. Um, the links are on the, in the chat, the links to all of our organizations. So don't forget to subscribe to never miss a thing. We have a lot, a lot of questions. So um, let's think of how we pick a few of them. Um, on international relations and US labor. I think I'm gonna pick up on one of these. Um, it's been mentioned that Uber has a close relationship with Saudi Arabia, Arabia the Obama administration, um, well, the Obama campaign manager, David Plouf helped to uh, head up the, uh, the Uber agenda. Um, can pressure on Uber from its drivers and customers be leveraged to affect Saudi Arabia's behavior or are there other uh, in Yemen or are there other examples where there are actually kind of um, leverage points um, that perhaps together we could uh, strategize around, no matter who's in the White House. Kathy. I think that's a really interesting idea. I think, you know, this taking on Saudi Arabia, as we saw, as some of us started organizing uh, as they were the hosts of the G20 this year, takes a lot of, of, of strategy uh, and thinking. Um, I think um, the, you know, right now we are pretty focused in terms of the, the Uber, I would say it's not to Uber as a stand-in for what plat the platform economy would like the global economy to look like. They would like flexible labor. They would like misclassified labor, labor that's not in unions or has power. Um, and I think there's a lot of organizing around that uh, across countries. Um, we've seen really innovative strategies from platform economy workers, but I think it's an interesting concept to think how do we use that power of organizing for sort of bigger um, pressure points on foreign policy. I don't think that's been, uh, my knowledge, it hasn't been attempted yet, um, but uh, you know, we're just at the beginning of really trying to harness um, this uh, organizing, uh, transnational organizing between uh, platform economy workers. Um, but right now it's mostly about shaping um, global and national labor policies that would be inclusive um, to all workers. Thanks, Kathy. For you, Walden, a question from Achen. Walden, is it at all likely that China in reaction to US ambitions in East Asia might consider trying to undermine US influence on Southeast Asian countries by pushing proposals for demilitarization, denuclearization of the South China Seas, as, as you've proposed in your writings? Uh, well, um, just as um, a background to that, uh, you know, basically, I, 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 I do think that this is a real zone of conflict, uh, both the East China Sea and the South China Sea, which in the Philippines we call the West Philippine Sea. And, um, you know, this is a real, uh, uh, you know, zone of conflict where two sides are making very provocative moves. moves. Um, as uh, the Vietnamese told me when I visited them in 2014, a ship collision could easily escalate into a conventional war in this area. So. The Vietnamese, all of us in Southeast Asia are very, very concerned about this kind of superpower rivalry. 
uh, we have proposed, and I think this is what um, um, what the the, uh, the person was referring to. We have proposed for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and Governments uh, to really take a very active uh, role in in pushing. Uh, uh, the proposal for demilitarization and denuclearization of the area, which would uh, basically affect uh, both China uh, in terms of needing to demilitarize from those islands that, that, that they've taken. And of course, the United States, which has about 300 bases in the area, in Japan, in Korea, uh, in the Philippines. So, so I think the civil society in the in in the association of southeast asian nations uh, and governments um, really need to uh, you know work uh, consistently and in a very determined way uh, to push these proposals because otherwise uh, what's really going to happen is that you will just have this escalating kind of balance of terror or balance of power competition between the United States and uh, China. Uh, and as we all know, a balance of power thing uh, is, is very unstable. And it's this, you know, the European balance of power ended up in the first world war. That is what we're really worried here in Asia at this point in time. And I think it's really, really important for demilitarization and denuclearization initiatives to be promoted very aggressively at this point. Thanks, Walden. Um, Phyllis, there are a couple of questions picking up on this. Um, well, A, wanting to know more about um, the likely implications for the Middle East, Palestine especially, and then one about the sort of independent foreign policy track that many European countries have taken in the kind of vacuum left by the United States under Trump, and whether a comeback to a kind of NATO style transatlantic uh, leadership would be a good thing. Well, on the second part first, I think it's never a good thing when the leadership is coming from the US and the military. That combination is a deadly one. So to the degree, I mean, ironically, several of the things Trump has done for all the wrong reasons could have interesting, not so terrible results, such as the weakening of NATO, uh, an organization that should be ended. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think the effort by the Biden administration is going to be to rebuild NATO. And I do think that, unfortunately, I, I think there will probably be a kind of, of gratitude, if you will, towards that view from a number, not all, but from a number of key European leaders who want to see NATO reemerge um, alongside the EU, particularly in the context of Brexit, uh, ch presenting new challenges to the EU as such. Uh, so that's one side of it. The Middle East part has become far more complicated. What I think will be consistent between Biden and Obama, a little bit different than Trump, will be that military aid to Israel is going to remain the same. I don't think there's, that we have much of a chance of ending that immediately, although I think cuts are possible. The amount of aid money that goes directly to the Israeli military, $3.8 billion a year, is absolutely unprecedented. It doesn't go to any other part of the world. Uh, it certainly doesn't go to impoverished nations that need actual aid rather than military support. It's only to Israel. Uh, Biden has his own version of Zionism. It's not a transactional kind of Zionism like Trump who sort of embraces it because it's a way of getting to a specific constituency. Biden actually seems to believe some of the mythology, what I consider the mythology of Zionism being the equivalent with, well, we won't get into that, there's not time for it, but I think that what we will see under a Biden administration will be closer to what we saw under Obama, where the military aid continues, but there is a shift in rhetoric so that there is a willingness to uh, state criticisms of settlement policies of the, the new Israeli so-called nation state law that essentially makes apartheid a legal component of Israeli law. Uh, but I don't think we will see 
a major shift. Where we may see a shift, there are significant shifts now in Congress, where it's not only from the left wing of Congress, the, the squad and others, but it's becoming a more mainstream issue that is no longer considered political suicide, as it hasn't been in the public for a long time. Shifts in the Jewish community, shifts in the Black community have been massive in recent years, and now we're starting to see the effect in Congress. I think we may see the possibility that some of that will increase and begin to put serious pressure on the White House to actually make good on the, the policy in general. The complication is that right now, overall US uh, policy in the Middle East is not solely based on how do we support Israel against the Palestinians. It's about Israel supporting Israel as the root of a anti-Iran coalition made up of Israel plus a number of key Arab states, Saudi Arabia being the most important, even though it has not yet officially uh, uh, built re new relations with Israel. The UAE has, other countries have as well. And it's that coalition, the anti-Iran coalition, which is shaping US policy. Biden is gonna have to walk a very fine line between wanting to go back to the Iran nuclear deal and re-engage diplomatically with Israel, uh, sorry, re-engage diplomatically with Iran at a moment when he's going to have to challenge Israeli positions, not only from Netanyahu, but from the entire Israeli political class and the vast majority of the Israeli population who Perfect. want to see this opposition to Iran take shape. So All that's right, gonna so be a real challenge. I gotta stop you there. We've got just six minutes left and a lot of good questions. And I've got to lift up one. I, I, I mentioned Central American America and I want to go back to Latin America for a second and to you, Kathy. Um, we're probably seeing by now a return of Evo Morales to Bolivia um, with the success of his party and the presidential elections there and the inauguration on Sunday of President Luis Arce. Um, I'm not suggesting there's a new pink wave hitting Latin America, but I am curious uh, to raise this part of the world and the situation there. You've been involved in protecting or working to protect labor rights in, in Mexico as well as here. Speak to what the future might hold there. Sure, and I, I also see some questions on Central America, so we'll try to address that as well. I think that um, we are hopeful. I think um, Chile, let's not forget what happened in Chile, the Chilean labor movement and allies organized, and it's a hopeful moment for a new inclusive constitution. Finally, how long did it take to get rid of Pinochet? I think of my colleagues at IPS who, who work on this for so many years. Um, if we have a constitution, can we, is the question. Okay, keep yes, going. Yes, yes. Um, Biden, what should we hope for um, change? Look, Biden and the staff he's probably going to bring on with him, very steeped in the Alliance for Prosperity. It was not much of a new framework. Um, you know, it wasn't going to give more, uh, you know, working people in Central America the right to stay or the right to migrate. It wasn't about investing in creating good jobs, investing in the economy in a way that was going to actually help families live decent lives. Um, so I, I think we have a lot of work there to do in terms of where the policy has been. Biden has been very involved in Latin America. So let's look at that space. I think we need to, there's lots of good groups already focused on this, but I fear that it would be a return to um, some of the same old policies um, that have been, uh, that have failed in the past. Um, I have a couple quick questions on, on trade policy. We don't have time here. People can follow up with me, especially so inside trade folks. Um, there is, I, you know, I think there is an opportunity. He has said that he does not want new free trade agreements. I actually think that's extremely hopeful. I think we need to focus on what are economic policies, what does a new template look like, so we're not just tweaking uh, a neoliberal model that's presented to us. Um, so, and, and, and looking at what do workers in this country and other countries need and what are the policies that we build? Trade is just one piece of the economic puzzle. Let's remember that. Um, and usually our trade policies are investment policies that help corporations. So I think the pause he keeps promising is one that we will hopefully uh, stick him to. Uh, we've been working with, for Kenya, I saw a question, we're working with the Kenyan trade union movement, CO2K, um, on making joint um, proposals on what would a trade agreement look like that would help Kenya as well as um, uh, U.S. workers. And so we're in a uh, partnership with them. So that's a real quick, uh, I think, <laughs> as we're wrapping up here, but happy to follow up with anyone on trade and, and Latin America issues. 
and I'm being reminded that there will be a TNI webinar. I think it's a TNI webinar on Latin America on the 18th. So again, reason again to sign up to subscribe to the newsletters and the mailing list for both TNI, IPS, and the Laura Flanders Show. Bill, it's possible that you will get the last word here. Um, and there are many words to cram into your last comments. I'd like to hear a little more on COVID, um, but authoritarianism, I, I think, is one word that you want to pick up on. Yeah, I did, Laura, um, because I think that, uh, and I think this is certainly true in the United States, we're not making a, a sufficient distinction and understanding that there really are two authoritarian threats. There's uh, been a neoliberal authoritarianism that has been growing systematically since the late 70s and early 80s. And it's been one that's been represented by uh, uh, an increasing shrinkage of the space for democratic discussion um, and debate and in the media, political realms, et cetera. We've seen that around the world. As neoliberalism has strengthened, so has this sort of authoritarian statism. The second form of authoritarianism has been right-wing populism. And in the United States, and, and it's a global phenomenon. In the United States, I think that one of our problems and, and including a misunderstanding of who Trump was uh, in 2016 by some segments of the left was not understanding this dire threat or this, and this movement, this right-wing populist movement that can sometimes use the language of the left. Uh, and, and we see that all around the world and therefore uh, can create an immense amount of confusion. So I just wanted to flag that as something because we don't have the time that can be explored at some other moment, but the distinction is very important at the level of strategy. Well, I think we are out of time and I will just quote the final comment that I can see on my chat screen, which is that nothing short of the liberation of people and planet will do. I think on that we all agree, and also that we're not about to see it. I think we all agree, uh, at least not between now and the end of January. I, I, I wanna thank all of our panelists, um, Phyllis, Kathy, Bill, Walden. Um, thank you as well to the whole TNI and IPS and Laura Flanders Show team. As I mentioned, there are lots of webinars coming up to make sure you don't miss them. Uh, sign up for the e-newsletter from these organizations. The links are all in the chat. And if you found today's session useful or any of the webinars that we've held so far, please also consider donating actual money um, to each or all of the organizations that you see on your screen. Thank you once again for joining us. We'll leave the chat open for a few minutes so you can fill in the poll and wrap up conversations there. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is just the first of many conversations that I hope we have on um, cultivating internationalist perspectives and power uh, in the current context to, as we mentioned, liberate people and the planet everywhere. Thank you all, appreciate it.